it's great to be back with you. I uh, I was thinking as I was driving down this morning about a couple of weeks ago coming down for the big celebration of the Bowmans and they're on their Rocky Mountain High now. We've been watching <laughs> Facebook and Pastor Andrew is on a Rocky Mountain Low right now. Yeah. I heard that Valerie decked him. Is that the truth? <laughs> but he's saying that he had nasal surgery is what it is. But there's Valerie back there. She looks in really good shape. Did you bring us a picture of Andrew that we can see this morning? Man, I was really hoping we could have that. But so we're praying for Pastor Andrew as he recovers from his surgery, and it's a great joy for us to be here this morning. You are, uh, and I don't say this everywhere, do I? You don't even know what I'm going to say, so how do you know? You're shaking your head. You are one of our all-time favorite churches and church families, and we really mean that. You've been so encouraging and supporting to us, and we uh, are so grateful to God for you. And we're excited about what God's doing here, and uh, so thankful for the, the wonderful uh, plan and transition that uh, God has helped you to go through as uh, the Bowman's transition to another aspect of life and ministry. And, Andrew and Valerie step right in and are doing right along, so it's, it's, that's good to know. Well, I'm going to have a word of prayer as we get started, and then I'm going to breeze through a lot of stuff. Uh, remind me what time I should be done. I mean, seriously, not like five minutes. If you say that, I know you're right. <laughs> and we'll have an all call. <laughs> what time should I be wrapping up? Church starts at 10.30. Church starts at 10.30, so I'm going to have quarter to 11. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I am so blessed to be here with Sharon and to be able to celebrate uh, your wonderful work of grace in our lives, and not just in our lives, but your plan for uh, the church to permeate uh, the culture and the world around us. Uh, through the Great Commission and demonstrating the gospel through the Great Commandment. And we pray as the church goes through this time of missions focus and emphasis this month that you will bless them greatly. And we uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to share about our partnership together through the Michigan Association of Regular Baptist Churches. May you be honored, glorified, and God, I pray that this will help people capture uh, even just a little bit of what is going on through the ministry that they are so actively a part of, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I've actually had the opportunity a few times, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this, there you go. Uh, I've been here a few times, so I've got to share certain parts of this in the past, only things continue to develop, and uh, God continues to bless in many different ways, so it's actually exciting for me to come and share with you, this is actually a brand new presentation that I just put together, and uh, I'll share with you a little bit why uh, as we go through. But uh, as you know, I was sharing with you a couple years ago that we had spent a lot of time, probably beginning back in uh, 2015, 2016, to look at the ministry of our association, obviously appreciating and valuing our heritage, but understanding uh, the times in which we live and especially the fact that in our almost 200 churches, uh, we were facing a fairly unique transition point for a lot of our pastors, just like Pastor Dan. Uh, our our uh, pastors are primarily populated by boomers, which is not a surprise. And uh, now, as we are uh, enjoying the fact that younger generations are, are sensing God's call into ministry, we've been trying to make sure that we articulate clearly uh, to those who come in, not just as pastors, but church members as well, that they understand why uh, an association like the Mission Association of Regular Baptist Churches is so important, so significant in how God has used us in the past. So we came up with a couple ways to just explain it based upon uh, maybe some terminology as well as some vision for uh, what we are seeking to do in the next uh, couple of decades. So we are a network of churches. That's what an association is. We are not a denomination. Every church is autonomous and independent, but the key issue is, and this is why I, I don't argue with pastors who, when I talk to them about our association, say, well, we're not a part of a denomination. It's actually in our constitution that we should not join a denomination. I said, great, you're right in the same camp with us. We are an independent group of churches, but we recognize, even biblically, as it's demonstrated in Acts and then in the New Testament letters, 
that we are interdependent upon one another. Uh, how many missionaries do you support that you sent out completely, totally on your own? That's just one example. For churches that say that to me, well, we're, we're independent, we don't work in the U.S., I said, well, great, how many missionaries have you sent out all on your own, all by yourself? Oh, no, we have some other church. Well, then you are not completely independent. And that's okay. It was never the design of the Word of God for us to be isolated islands. And so that's what we're talking about when we enter our mission state. When we talk about the network existing, you connect churches with one another. Uh, we will be having a very unique format for our conference this year. We have an annual conference every October because of COVID issues. We've had to actually go from having a three day conference up at Lake Ann, where we're going to have some really great strategic times, to where now we're doing three one day conferences. And so that's why I said this is my first trial run with this because we're willing to be for Tuesday. I'll be uh, near Marquette for the UP version of our conference. And then uh, the following week on Monday, we'll be in Flint. Tuesday, we'll be in Grand Rapids. And we're doing it one day so that, uh, and we made it hopefully somewhat convenient by location that they can. Uh, travel in one day to get there in the morning, and uh, we're going to do very basic box, box lunches so we can be uh, COVID-friendly in that regard. And uh, then we're going to finish in the afternoon in time that they can get back to their homes and not have to do an overnight. So that's kind of the strategy, except I have to. I have to go and spend the night in different places, so you can pray for, for me and for Sharon and I as we, as we do that. But uh, it's an exciting time for us. But while we're seeking to help our people understand is that we are connecting with one another's churches, and the joy is that we have a new church that will be coming into our association. Uh, they've been approved by our council. Our messengers will be voting on them, and they're in a community up near the bridge uh, in Gaylord, and we're really excited about that, and we actually have three other churches that couldn't uh, get this process completed this year, so in the next year or two, we'll have at least three others that will be coming in to the association as well. We're thankful for that. But one of the biggest things as a part of the mission statement as well is the fact that we really want to be catalysts to help those churches in our network reach their communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so hopefully this is a little more memorable in terms of the statement and helps uh, all of us to be focused on the great commission, great commandment ministry that Christ has called us to. Our core values, actually, that's what I talked through the last time I was here because we had just work through these, so I'm not going to take time to do that today, uh, but we do have uh, a very strong focus on the local church, strong focus obviously based upon the Word of God, and uh, we recognize that every community is different. I don't know if you knew this, but you're, you're a rather different community down here around the Dun Lake area than um, even up where I will be, uh, Lord willing, we from Tuesday up in Nagani near Marquette. A uh, little different scenario. Uh, you're that's just a little bit different than what we notice where we live in Grand Rapids. Uh, as far as we've been looking for the belt line around here to get to places faster. So, so far we haven't been able to find the belt line around Orangeville, but uh, we keep looking every time we come down. But uh, so we understand that every church has been planted by the Lord for specific purposes. And part of that is like Jesus to have incarnational ministry based upon the communities where they live and where they serve. So that means that you have to not just cookie cut every ministry practice based upon what someone else is doing in some other location where that may work and it might not here. Uh, so uh, that's uh, part of what we're doing as we, as we try to equip and uh, train. Uh, this, is, this is the MARBC. We have 175 plus churches that are organized in our state association in the seven regions. You'll notice up in the UP, uh, I think those are dark blue uh, dots. All those represent churches in our fellowship. And actually, this is off the new website that we just launched a month ago. And uh, now, when we go on our website, if you click on one of those location spots, it actually takes them to the church's website if they have one, or at least it'll do a Google map so they know exactly where they're located. And we've got a lot of new features uh, on the web site that has, was developed over a year to try to help us to be very interactive and practical, not just for our churches, for, but for people who may be looking for a local church as they transition into a community. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of uh, what we look like. And so you see the different colors represent the seven regions of 
in our association. Each of those regions have a pastoral representative that is seated on our council. Uh, we have a council of 16, which is like our ministry governing and oversight board, and it's comprised of 16 pastors. Nine of those are voted on by our messengers, three each uh, conference year. They serve three-year terms, so we'll be having elections while we are going through that. We won't be having any kind of debates or whatever that was last Tuesday. That will not be a part of our associational meetings, but we, we do uh, appreciate the men that God has raised up to serve in that way. Now, can you guess what is the biggest question that I've been asked the last, let's see, this is October. So I've been back on the road uh, since the uh, middle of June speaking in churches. Can you guess what the number one question is that I get asked in the last uh, almost four months now? Do you have to wear a mask? Well, that's part of it. The bigger picture is the question, how are other churches dealing with this weird word called COVID or coronavirus? And uh, so that's that's uh, one of the things I'd like to talk with you about for a couple of moments, but before I get down to the nitty gritty of what that's involved me with, uh, with our churches, and actually not even in our state alone, but I've been on uh, Zoom meetings, conference calls uh, from other parts of the country as well, especially uh, late in the spring and the early summer. So here's some COVID impressions just so you can uh, kind of relate to what's going on around our state. This is one thing I saw on the left. Uh, God's pretty busy this day showing how actually unwise we are in a lot of ways. And I like first isolation is 24-7. That's, that's a new Bible version that just came out. Uh, if you didn't know that, as for me in my house, we will stay where we are at. So that's a joke, by the way. Yeah. I think Sharon found this one. Uh, on the on the left, I don't know if you found on the right. Someone sent this to me, but the wife says, "Did I get fat during quarantine?" I said, like, "You never really were skinny." Time of death, April twenty fifth, twenty twenty, cause of death, coronavirus. <laughs> so that's what's going on with some people in their homes. Um, this is, I'm an Andy Griffith fan. By the way, yesterday was the sixtieth anniversary of the first episode of the Andy Griffith Show. Or tags, as those of us who are real aficionados know it. T A G S, the Andy Griffiths show. Okay? And uh, so, you know, my hero is Barney Fife. It's probably not shocking you that Barney would be my hero, but there's Barney going through various stages while he's dealing with coronavirus. And finally, you know, as he dresses up as a lady to try to keep the bank from being robbed. Uh, that's uh, when you know you've been home for way too long. Uh, this is what some of you have been dealing with watching church at home on uh, live stream. On the right, and then there's what mostly pastors look like pre coronavirus virus and post coronavirus. <laughs> and frankly, that, that's actually true in some senses. I mean, there's been some that have really been through some rough times. And then finally, I like these two. <laughs> Uh, 
community is different as far as some of their standards and statutes, and every state is different. I don't know if you knew that or not, but every state is different in terms of how some are handling this. And so there are a lot of financial legal uh, ramifications to that. And so knowing that I would get a lot of calls, uh, that's what I was doing a lot. So I would normally, the our day would go, Sharon would say, so what's going on today? I said, I'll just be on Zoom meetings all day. And uh, I have to let her know the ones where people can see me on the other side, or if it's just a one way, you know, I can tell her, you know, you can come in any time, you don't have to worry about, you know, things. And uh, if your hair is messed up from the COVID situation, so my husband didn't have to worry about. A lot of pastoral counseling, and this is where you really need to pray, because um, I give this little disclaimer as I preach in churches. Uh, we are really finding out right now, especially I believe in the Western culture, how much of our perspective of Christianity, and actually the local church, is a cultural condition or a true biblical condition. And here's the way that I typically illustrate it. We were talking about India earlier as I was talking with uh, a few of our folks here. I've been over in India, and uh, I preached with my best friend at the largest slum in Asia. And basically, we were out where there was just all this dirt, looked like clay soil. And I don't know where they came from, but they tell me, I didn't count, but they said there were between two and 3,000 people sitting on the dirt three hours in the hot sun, no trees, clear sky, uh, all age groups. There were little ones with their, with their moms sitting in their lap, I mean, we're talking infants, toddlers, preschoolers. Uh, there were middle-aged and there were older adults. What amazed me is for three hours, these people sat there, including the kids. They didn't run around, they didn't get up to leave on their way with God. And they listened to two of us preach the word of God. We worshiped with them. We sang. And I, I said to my friend when we were done, we had tears in our eyes. It was just an amazing thing. I said, that was really a church worship service. I don't even know where they got the generator to have the sound equipment that they brought in so that they could hear us. But that's all they had. And that was enough. I've been in Ukraine, our church in Grand Rapids, when I passed there, invested almost five, uh, half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, to help a church that uh, was in southern Ukraine. And during the Soviet regime, they had their building bulldozed down five different times. They rebuilt, and after a few months, the Soviets would come back and bulldoze it down. And our church heard about that after the Iron Curtain fell, and our people had a burden to help this church rebuild again. I would preach on Sundays, and then after I was done with the service, uh, the people would go out that were going to go to the various teams to go over and help them rebuild this building. And they had these little forms. They were learning how to make concrete blocks basically out of nothing, because that's what they would have to do when they went over there to help wreck what ended up being an amazing building. And I was over there for the uh, dedication of that with a lot of our, our people who had been on those teams. Then it's had windows installed, yes, it was all open, this was in the summertime, and not only was that building filled, but there were people outside the windows listening, and even though it was all in Russian, I didn't really understand everything, as I heard them singing, as people with tears running down their faces, eyes full of joy, I thought, this is the church. So, yeah, I don't like that. A lot of people like when I wear a mask when I do. That's okay. Some say, why don't you extend it all the way up? <laughs> That's okay as well. I can stick my tongue out at them while they're saying that. They don't know it. <laughs> I don't like some of the restrictions. But on the other hand, I recognize that I'm not an island to myself, nor are we as a local church to our community. And so there's a balance there. I'm not going to say, you know, how you land one way or the other, but we just need to appreciate the fact that above all of this, we're going to be salt and light. And so with that in mind, we need to make sure that we are, even though we don't always understand why leadership makes certain types of comments or gives certain kinds of uh, guidelines, we at least have to respect that they've done their research. And some of them have talked to people like me to just say, in general, here's what we're hearing. 
Here's what we found to be the best protocol. It's going to change as time goes on. Uh, even financially, as I've been doing a couple of cohorts online with our churches, even financially, I've encouraged a lot of churches to consider doing like a sliding, uh, a, a rotating budget for a year because none of us know how financially this is still going to impact us personally uh, as citizens as well as uh, even for our churches and our missions and all of that long term. So we just need to realize that the statement we like to kind of flippantly throw out there, you know, trust the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him will direct your path and make it straight. It's, that's really true. God, God included that in His work for a reason. And uh, a lot of pastors are getting punched a lot. And that's not why they enter the state home. They're not being punched in because of some COVID situation. But we have a lot of guys that I've been on the phone for within an hour or more that are really hurt. And uh, so we need to pray. Pray for the unity of the church, for the true vision that we need to have. The Great Commission needs to go on hold when COVID hit. Actually, the Great Commission needs to be even stronger with that. And then we've been talking a lot about reentry strategies. Uh, this is your first day to have this kind of a gathering. But you were far ahead of some churches being been involved with, with how you can able to handle services. Uh, we never know when we get to a church parking lot, uh, you know, what the protocol is going to be. Even if the pastor has shared with us, there's the established protocol, and then you see what people do. And so uh, we always wear masks when we first come into a building, and then we just kind of see what the, the normal situation is. Uh, so re-entry strategies. There are some churches that have not yet opened in Michigan. Uh, actually, there's one one set of churches only about uh, maybe 35 to 40 minutes from here that will begin to reopen uh, next week, and that is in a very limited, small context type setting. And one is a rather large church, and so there's a lot of that that we've been talking with uh, our churches about, as well as then long range ministry considerations. One of the great things about COVID is we're learning what is important and what is not. And so as churches, we're deciding now, uh, all over the country and all over the world, uh, this is time for us to discover, okay, some things that we've been doing may not actually be the most effective way. They're biblical, they're practical, but maybe just like uh, in past days, some things that we used to do that were very effective but now are not, maybe there's some other things that we need to either revamp, uh, but evaluate, and then uh, see what we need to do steps as we begin to re-engage. So that's a lot of what has been on uh, in my life and in our church's lives over the past uh, six to seven months now. Uh, we did we did launch a new website and uh, it's uh, it's pretty much up to date, although one of my complaints in the past was our website wasn't easily updated and uh, because we had a glitch after we first launched it, there are some outdated uh, current supposedly current uh, ministry opportunities that have already been here and done that, and so we're going to be working on that. I'm actually online with our uh, web developer uh, this week as they kind of train me with this, and then our webmaster will be trained later in the month with that, but uh, marbc.net, marbc.net, uh, you can go on there and you can see things. We hope to post some of the uh, video streams of messages that we'll be doing at our regional conferences and things like that. So we're thankful for that. Want to talk a little bit about probably the biggest things going on in my life right now and in the life of the MARBC, even more so than COVID, because even during COVID time, we've been working on a lot of uh, this aspect of things. And I got to catch up to where my uh, PowerPoint slides are, so I make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, we are working on uh, a very specific strategy. For church revitalization. A year ago, I was talking with our council, and I said, you know, I, I've done a lot of uh, churches where I go in for a weekend, and I do what I call a strategic ministry planning uh, retreat, and they pick out a handful of people that represent a cross-section of ministries in a church, and uh, I help them just kind of think through uh, how effective some of these ministries are, uh, if there's a way to do them better, if there's a better way for recruitment to get new workers, things like that. Uh, 
I, I, I share with them examples that I've seen and I've known of from other churches. And uh, it's a great weekend. I, I usually then, about a week later, I, I send them uh, a little booklet that kind of summarizes all that we've covered. And there's a couple churches I'm still working with uh, three and four years later just with specific things that they identify as key opportunities or key needs for their church. Uh, out of that, I realized that I mean, there are a lot of churches, not just in our association, but churches in general that have plateaued in their ministry over the years, and now they're, if, if you do the bell curve, they're on the downward slope. Some of them are way down here, and they're close to uh, uh, basically death. And there are some that are, if they don't make some strategic biblical changes in the next couple of years, they will be right down there with those others. And so I was really worried about that and, and beginning with our own association. And so um, I had uh, looked at some opportunities for me to get further training uh, in those types of aspects. And so uh, last uh, March, actually the day before our state got shut down, we were meeting as our ministry council in Mount Pleasant. And I shared with the guys that I, I had signed up for this, and they said, well, does it cost anything? I said, yeah, I mean, we already paid, or you got a discount if you did two of them rather than one. And they said, no, we want to take that out of our association uh, ministry fund. And so during COVID, along with being in other meetings, uh, Zooming and, and streaming and things like that, I also was being coached through two different things. One is uh, just uh, church consultation, but more specifically was um, – I'm now certified uh, with church revitalization. Uh, we've been doing a lot of that in our state. We've been encouraging that. We haven't had a lot of the hands-on leadership of that as an association, but we have been partnered with some churches uh, to help them be able to connect with other churches in our network to be able to uh, come alongside a, a struggling church and help them. And I mentioned this church when I was here uh, the last time we had an opportunity to give you an update. Uh, the church in Montrose uh, was a church that about five years ago was about to die, and they called me. They're, they're, they had three deacons left. They were running, I think, in the 30s, and uh, they heard, they saw my schedule. They saw I was going to be on the east side of the state speaking somewhere on Sunday morning. They asked me if I'd be willing to drive to Montrose, which is uh, near Flint, on my way back to Grand Rapids. So I did it, and uh, that moment in the study, the former pastor's study, uh, we'll never forget every time we see each other, we talk about that. There's four guys in there, including me, and as they're telling, giving the testimony of the challenges the church faced, uh, we're all in tears. Three grown men, three businessmen, um, just in tears. And they said, do you think we need clothes? And uh, they shared their story, and up to that point, I'm thinking, I don't think they're going to make it. And again, this is just me, a finite human being, seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging that Christ is the head of this church, the Savior of the body. But I'm thinking in my mind, I don't know how they're going to do this, but when I saw their commitment, I said, no, I don't think you should close. But you do need help. And let's pray that God will give you that direction. So... That was on a Sunday. I get a call on Tuesday from a pastor in Flint, one of our uh, healthy MERC churches. And he said, Ken, or actually it was Wednesday, he said, Ken, we had a uh, leadership meeting Tuesday night, our deacons and uh, pastoral staff. And uh, one of our young deacons in our prayer time said, uh, Would you pray for the church I grew up in, where my parents are still members, my dad's a deacon? They're about to die, is Montrose Baptist Church. And uh, so the big agenda item for that church on their uh, leadership meeting that night was they had been praying about planting a new local church somewhere in the greater Flint, Genesee Valley, uh, Automation Alley area. And uh, so they got started on the agenda, and one of the deacons just said, wait a minute. Why do we want to invest the funds to start a new church when if we don't help the church, the sister church, over, you know, 20 miles from us, we're going to have to go in there at some point and plant another church. Why don't we investigate first if this might be a good option? So that's why the pastor called me on Wednesday because they knew I'd been there. And Scott and I talked together and uh, actually have a good friend. 
friend who pastors in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, at a board meeting that we both were involved in, uh, just a couple months before, he said, Ken, our church is very actively involved in training pastoral interns. And he said some of them end up staying with us. And they have large Christian schools, so a lot of them end up teaching Bible in Christian school. They help, help out with ABS or whatever. And um, he said, some of these guys just need to be a pastor. They need to be a pastor. So um, I just want you to know that. So I call my friend and I say, hey, could we come down? They, it's a church in Toledo. And I said, could we come down, myself and this pastor from this other church, and could we just use your office to actually interview however many? Six different pastors on staff there involved in different things we met with over an afternoon. We interviewed them all, took notes. Scott and I are driving our way back. We're talking over the ones that might be best for Montrose to consider as their revitalization pastor. And out of the six, you see Shane uh, Miller out there next to the church sign. Uh, and uh, they, he ended up, in Shelley, his wife, moved from Toledo up to Montrose. They've been there uh, almost three years now. And God has done some amazing things there in terms of revitalization. What is really neat is uh, our churches, when they were nominating people to serve on that council, 16, our ministry board, they nominated Shane, and he's now a part of our ministry board because they realized that his experience in this area is going to help us to be effective in a practical way. So we're really thankful for that. So when I go in now more in a more official role as a, a church revitalization uh, counselor, one of my first thoughts is we're not going to do it as an association. We have some funding, and I obviously can give input, and I take them through several things and working with the church. I'll talk about in a minute right now and tell you what we're doing with them. But what we try to do is connect them with another or another two or three or four sister churches that can come alongside of them, and those churches are healthy, and they can actually give them some real practical support, and that's what's happening in Montrose. Uh, right now, and this is the one I was just alluding to, uh, we are working with First Baptist Church in North Adams. And um, I'm actually booked there to speak every other month through the month of March. Their pastor resigned uh, during COVID back at the end of June, and their deacon chair called me to ask me for help with their pastoral search. But before he did that, he said, Ken, we met not just as leaders of this church, uh, they at one time ran around 200, and they're running about 40 now in their uh, Sunday morning attendance. And he said, we actually had a, a church family meeting, an official one, Wednesday night, just to talk through where we're at. And they knew that I was going to call you and said, before we look for a pastor, we really need help in reconnecting with our community. And, uh, wow, when I heard that. And this is a deacon that's called me a few times about how do we encourage our pastor. And so they've got a really good heart. And I said, I think we might be able to help you. And so we've, I've been there three times now since uh, the end of July. And I uh, was there two weeks ago and took them through their first meeting with their revitalization task force to help them with that. And so what we did early on was we went in. I drove around the town. It's just a very little village. Um, if you took I don't even know how to find Orangeville. I'm sorry. I doubt that most of you do either. But if you took this general area and you just kind of compressed it into maybe a five-minute radius, that's kind of worth Adams. Amazingly, and it's like a lot of small towns. A lot of they've got a lot of shuttered buildings in a little downtown village area. Seriously, First Baptist Church has the best building in North Adams. Their auditorium is a little older, it's a little dated in terms of style, uh, but they added a big uh, multi-purpose facility on the back uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, so we started talking about the fact that, you know, if you want to reach your community, there are some ways that you can do that. Uh, and I shared actually an example from you, and the fact that you know, some churches are looking at things like biblical counseling. I said, I would imagine that there are challenges in the North Adams area in Hillsdale County uh, that might, people might benefit from biblical counseling. And uh, then also the biggest issue is that their internet stinks. 
That's the Greek word, by the way, snake, snake stuff. Uh, it, it, it's terrible. Uh, they, and I knew that because I try to send them stuff, and sometimes they don't get it by email. And, but the good news was that uh, Comcast just came into the village. It did, not outside the village, and I don't know why, marketing-wise, they want to just go to this little village of about 3,000 people. But they just come there. And so I talked with another, actually, First Baptist Church, and uh, they contacted me yearly in the last five years. Are there any projects that we could uh, connect to for our Thanksgiving office? So I tell this pastor, here's the vision that this church has. We would like the finances to bring internet into the building, as well as the parsonage, but more so into the building with uh, Wi-Fi pods all around the building, so you have the same Wi-Fi strength throughout the building. And then for families where their kids need to be online to do their schoolwork, open up that multi-purpose building as a Wi-Fi cafe. I appreciated that when I was in India because you never got Wi-Fi anywhere, but in all those towns, even the little towns, you could go to Wi-Fi cafe, and that's when I could send at least a, a sentence to Sharon and say, I'm still alive. <laughs> I will, I'll tell you the rest when I get back. And there were some doozy stories I could tell her that I thought, I tried to tell her now and it broke off mid-sentence, she'd think, he, he's dead. <laughs> so, but but uh, we are looking at that. They're also going to build them a website to help them connect into the community. And uh, so we've already done a demographic study of the area, and I had fun last week two weeks ago, Quizman. So why do you think the average person, and then I give them an example, and then I let them guess. And uh, the excitement, it's a sad thing, but it's an exciting thing for a local church. 75% of the people that live within a 10-minute radius of that church are unchurched. They don't go anywhere. 75%. I said, I think that's pretty good, uh, pretty good opportunity for this church to really engage with the gospel. So uh, now I'm having them do a, a personal assessment of the church ministry. So there's this online assessment tool that uh, they just started taking. I've already gotten three responses from the 12 on the committee on the task force to say, hey, we finished that. And so when I go back in November to meet with them again, because I preach and then I, we spend the afternoon talking strategy. And they just now started uh, this week. They start their doing missions month as well there. They're starting uh, evening service rather than doing Sunday school like you are. So there are two services now, and we're going to talk about these things on Sunday night. So that's kind of what we're doing as an association. There are, right now, including North Adams, there are eight revitalization projects going on across our state through the MERBC. There are two churches that were significantly helped by a large church in the Great Grand Rapids area. One of the churches was way out in farm country, and uh, it's the first time in 14 years with the MERBC, it was uh, about 12 then, that I looked at leaders when they asked me, should we stay open or should we close, and I said, you need to shut down. And it's because they've been through all kinds of church wars, and their testimony in that little farm area was horrible. I said, but don't shut down the idea that nothing else is going to happen here. You need to let a strong church come in and restart in another way. So a church that was down to probably 30, something like that, when we were there for the last service they had, um, they grown some. They're running about 200 now. You do the math. That's a pretty large percentage increase. And we praise God for that. And another church that had uh, very difficult situations in the Grand Rapids area is now running two services when they were on fumes as well. Uh, we just had a church uh, north of Grand Rapids that one of our other regular Baptist churches came alongside of. They've been through some uh, church challenges in terms of internal strife and things. And uh, they are back up. They were down to about uh, 30, and now they're running over 100. And they just called a new pastor who starts actually today. And uh, so the strength is in having our churches partner with one another in those types of areas. And then I can give 
the uh, overall viewpoint in terms of some practical things to help them in that regard. So we're very excited about that and we're thankful for what God is doing in that, in that realm. Uh, you know all about CPR. Actually, I think when we launched it, you were one of the first churches we shared about it. So I would just say this very quickly. When we first started with the ARBC, I'm, I'm a space geek. I grew up during the, the space race. I watched every launch, uh, almost every launch of every uh, non-Mercury. That was early days of my life. I think I remember the last Mercury uh, rocket going on. I know that's still aging me by saying that. But I watched all the Gemini launches, all the Apollo launches. Uh, and then I was in ministry, so I didn't even watch them as regular. They didn't have them all 24-7 like they did back when, when I was a kid and an adolescent. But I talked with our council and talked with our pastors in our state that um, if we're really going to be effective as an association, we need to do uh, – ministry strategy in sizable bites. And so I said, I guess I would compare it to how our country developed NASA as the space program. They started small, so they started with single rocket, single capsule, sending one man into outer space, basically just to see how he would endure. That is CPR. I, when Sharon and I went around our state the first year or so, and especially in the UP, we just heard a lot of needs. I can remember being in Newberry, and that's where, of course, the Manborns were. And uh, that was a church I thought they were going to die. As a matter of fact, we were there on a Sunday night because they didn't have a service on Sunday night. I preached somewhere else in the morning, and they asked if I could come by and help them look for a pastor. And they're telling me their story, and I'm sitting there, and I'm still very young in this position. And uh, so I say, okay, I'll do what I can and see if I can help you find someone. And uh, Sharon's sitting in another room there in the building, and she said, how did it go? I said, just get in the car, get in the car. She got in the car, and she said, so how did it go? I said, we got to get down the road a little bit. Because I didn't want anyone from that meeting to see me in the car because I pulled off and I started to cry. And I said, there's, I just see no hope for this church. And uh, God said, okay, Ken, there's a teachable moment for you. So just a few days later, I get a call from this guy. He calls me from the east and he says, hi, my name is Andrew. Uh, before uh, you start asking me questions, I need to tell you my story. So he started telling me about his background, about his dad, his dad pastoring in small towns, uh, including the Maine. I don't know if you've been to Maine, but if you've been to the UP, it's Maine without all the mountains. Small towns, uh, very cloistered communities, and by the time I was done with Andrew, I said to him, I think I might have just been in your next church. And God used Andrew and Valerie, and then their growing family, in a wonderful way there. And we're so thankful for that. But part of the way that we started was doing this church partner relationship. So we had groups that would go out including to uh, Newberry to help with BBS programs and all over the UP we had that in soccer programs, uh, building programs, uh, just things that all of us are able to do very practically. Doesn't take a lot. So that was the Mercury Project. Just simple launch processes, take a few orbits around the Earth and then come back to where you live. Okay, that kind of thing. And so that's what we still do. And that actually is what helped us as an association reconnect as churches to realize we can actually partner together in some very neat ways. But that's not enough. So then we went to the fact that I said, then we need to go into Gemini, which is that we have churches partnering together in more specific things. And that's where you get, you open capsule, you start doing space walks, a little more risky. And that's what church revitalization is. You're going to give up yourself. It's going to put you in a little bit greater risk, even as the church coming in to support a church, because it means you're going to have to give up some of the finances that you normally use in another way. And if the, if the ministry is close enough, you're going to have some of your church family go to help in that situation, which has happened in most all of those uh, revitalization projects that I referenced earlier. And so that's what they've done. And so that is a big part of what we've done. And then finally, church planning. And that's the Apollo mission, where we're actually launching people to go land on the moon or wherever that is in Michigan to plant new churches. And uh, that we are involved in that. Uh, I mentioned Grace Hispanic and other people here uh, that are very familiar with Grace Hispanic and Grant, and that's what we're looking at. So those are the things that we're looking at right now, and uh, these are the things that we continue to do in our ministry.
ministry. We were doing a lot of things online. Uh, I've been uh, teaching on different areas of practical ministry with our pastors as they try to understand how do we reboot uh, now that we are at least allowed to do that during this uh, pandemic. And uh, we appreciate your prayer support. We still do the inner past ministry as well, where we do pastoral assistance and inner pastors and all that. And we just thank God for your prayer and financial support on our behalf. Be glad to talk to you in the break and after the uh, service this morning, but we need to land uh, the rocket here. We're in our final reentry. Uh, the shoes came out, by the way. We're going to land softly uh, in uh, whatever warm body of water you would like. <laughs> Thank you so much for your partnership with us. This is some, this is what you thank you. Are you applying just because I'm finally done? Or are you excited? You're laying it safely. There you go, you're laying it safely. All right. Can we pray as we close this part of our day? Thank you, Father, for the joy that is out just to be a part of the family of God. Thank you, Father, that you saved us by your grace extended through the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, that you said, I will build my church. And it's our joy to be used of you as the head of the church, as sister churches, local churches spread throughout the state to partner together, to share with great zeal and great purpose and great commission the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not just stopping with seeing people come to Christ, but the true teeth of the Great Commission is making disciples who then go out and do likewise. And we are so thankful for the many churches, including Orangeville Baptist, who weekly and daily are desirous of taking the word of God and seeing it applied and ingrained in the lives of people. Bless this church as they navigate uneasy waters. But frankly, Lord, we know that's, especially as we look at the Word of God, that's been, that's been the uh, modus operandi for the church throughout the centuries, throughout the millennials, that in uncertain times, the bedrock truth of God's Word, the solid rock of Jesus Christ, is what allows us to be stable and to be confident in times that bring us an uneasiness. And so we thank you. Pray for this church as they continue to lead in that way. Bless, we pray, the worship service that we share together in a few moments. For your glory, we pray, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you.